All right, folks. Well, um, is it still too late to say Happy New Year? Is it too late? No? Okay. Unanimous. Happy New Year. Welcome you all to our first uh, Berkman Klein Center Tuesday Luncheon Series of 2017. We're so excited that all y'all could be here. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, as always, this is being live webcast. Um, so in the event that you have something that you don't, just know that you're being recorded, okay, uh, for posterity. Um, and it'll end up on YouTube. So be mindful of what you do or do not say. Um, that's one. Two, on January 24th, we will be having a talk between um, Berkman Klein Director Susan Crawford and the Chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Tom Wheeler, entitled U.S. Communications at a Crossroad. That talk will be at 4 p.m., um, and details of that are on our website, cyber.harvard.edu slash events. Um, and so now, at this point, I will um, hand the mic over to Susan Manesh, Berkman Klein Center Faculty Associate. Thank you all. So I could just say, uh, Dr. Kishana Gray, force of nature, and then uh, shut up. But uh, that, that would pretty much sum her up. But I think I'm expected to give you some details, so here come some details. Kishana is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center, as well as a Martin Luther King scholar and an assistant professor at MIT this uh, academic year. She is also a faculty visitor at the Social Media Collective at Microsoft uh, Research here in Cambridge. Um, in her abundant spare time, she likes to tour Boston with her partner and her children. Um, <clears throat> her work broadly uh, intersects identity and digital media, she focuses particularly on deviance in gaming um, uh, and works on video games uh, uh, and gaming culture. Her most, most uh, recent book, Race, Gender, and Deviance in Xbox Live, examines um, the, uh, uh, the reality for women and people of color uh, in what is, after all, one of the world's largest uh, gaming communities. Kishana has published very uh, widely. Um, she founded the Critical Gaming Lab at Eastern Kentucky University. She works with the Equity in Gaming Initiative, uh, equityingaming.com. Uh, she is a featured blogger and podcaster with uh, Not Your Mama's Gamer. Uh, and she actively blogs on not one but two personal websites. Um, she and her partner also collect uh, uh, console games. And in the not very distant future, we all will join in her activities by uh, um, uh, engaging in various activities at the adult gaming lounge she plans to open, which will be called High Scores. <laughs> It means exactly what you think it means. It means exactly what you think it means. And with that, for the moment, <laughs> I so give good. you this authentic force of nature, Kishana Gray. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate oh. you. <laughs> I also must tell you two things. Please participate, those of you who are not fortunate enough to be in the room, and those of you who are using the hashtag up there on the board, BKC Harvard. And also, Kishana says you are welcome to ask questions not only at the end, you don't have to behave yourselves quietly and wait till the end, right. but you may also interrupt her during. Yep, absolutely. Just raise your hand. Absolutely. We cannot begin without acknowledging. Mariel, it's her birthday, everybody. Please join me in singing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mariel. Happy birthday to you. Love you, Mariel. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, 
I'll spend, you know, some time, you know, talking about, I guess, the, the journey that has led me to create um, this framework, this black digital feminist framework. Um, and it's also, it's been influenced by a lot of things that are happening now, my own experiences in gaming culture. Um, and it's, it's an organic thing. It's a living thing. So it's constantly evolving, you know. Um, so please feel free to chime in, share your thoughts, comments, um, personal uh, uh, feelings and opinions about it. Um, please be interactive because you know, I really want it to be a framework that can best capture the digital practices um, and the physical practices of, of women of color and also other communities that are working for marginalized populations. Okay? So I've been at a crossroads, both personally and intellectually, over consuming the presidential campaign and election of Donald Trump, making sense of the hyper visibility of black death at the hands of the state, Surviving the onslaught of violence in gaming communities, being broke and looking for a job. I'm struggling to identify what's the most appropriate thing to say, really, um, in, in, at this moment. And I just constantly ask myself, you know, how did we get here and why? But where is here? You know, what is this moment that we're in? Is it alt right domination? Is it the rise? of white supremacy and toxic masculinity? Is it post-Gamergate or, or post-racial reality? You know, what matters most in this moment? So as I was thinking about, you know, what I was going to say in this space, I found myself having more questions, you know, really than, than answers. But I'll spend some time, you know, providing my own thoughts and really thinking about, you know, the framework that is helping me make sense of a lot of things. Um, but I'm hoping we can engage this collectively as well. But before we begin, let's take a trip, right? Let's imagine that we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Berkman Klein Center, if you will, right? What are we recalling then, you know, from this moment right now? Is it success? You know, is it the end of, you know, online hate and harassment? Is it the dismantling of heteronormative white supremacies, patriarchy, you know, you know, we can dream. Um, is it mobilization, transformation, post-trauma or survivor narratives? You know, what all of these are some of these, you know, what, what will we be talking about in that moment? Um, I was moved by, um, there was an article the day after the election of, of Donald Trump that read, um, Black women were the only ones who tried to save the world. Last night was what it read initially. Um, my initial reaction was really to laugh and just tweet, right? You know, I was like, oh, that's funny, that's hilarious. Um, so I did, I tweeted it. Um, and I got like a, it was a large backlash of comments and you know, I ventured into the comment sections of other you know, platforms that shared this. And of course, when you go to the comment section, you know what you're in for, right? But I was overwhelmed by the um, response of people who really didn't think that black women had the capacity to do anything except make babies and collect welfare checks, right? Now, and I realized that the headline, you know, it, it simplifies, you know, a complex problem. It simplifies a complex, peop complex and diverse people, right? But it also highlights the hidden figures or hidden fences for some of y'all, right? <laughs> Behind some of our most significant moments in history, right? Ida B. Wells, Audre Lorde, Kimberly Crenshaw, Gloria Anzaldúa, Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth, you know, she strategically uh, struck a blow to whiteness and to masculinity and to the slave economy and also to, you know, white women who would begin the dangerous trend of just privileging a singular form of, of feminism and womanhood. Ain't I a woman? And that small, powerful phrase that Sojourner Truth articulated, it was the beginnings of intersectionality. What it means to be black and a woman and poor that powerful narrative would continue th 
through the movement for civil rights and women's rights and gay rights, when women of color sometimes would be the only to articulate an intersectional stance that highlights the interlocking nature of oppression. From Sojourner Truth to Combahee to Moya Bailey, you know, we have constantly have to constantly remind the world of the lashes of neglect, of invisibility, exploitation, marginalization, misogynoir. And because this cultural script is so common, these norms are assumed. So when the hidden figures are made visible, our immediate questions are, how did they overcome so much and break through so many barriers? Instead of asking why the barriers exist in the first place. We spend our voyeuristic gaze peering into the lives of women of color as if watching a rat race, knowing that they won't win. And if and when they do, it's extraordinary. It's superhuman. It's magical. I instead turn the gaze away from the what and beyond the how and start exploring the why, right? And history plays an important part in our current situation and our future directions. So let's go back now to 1869, to the American Equal Rights Association Convention. Frederick Douglass argued that issues pertaining to race were more salient than gender. Douglass felt that by incorporating black women into the Negro debate, this would mean the, this would reduce, excuse me, the chances of securing the ballot for black men. He articulated and outlined the horrors of, of slavery, of lynching, of slave codes, plantation reality. And he seemed to easily forget that women too were subject to these atrocious practice, practices and more vulnerable to their effects. But this trend to center men of color's experiences would continue to be articulated through reconstruction, through the different movements, civil rights, Chicano movement, women's movement through to current trends to focus singularly on black and, brown black and brown men. The unspoken rule to vow loyalty to a race pervades whiteness as well. White womanhood has been created and it has been central in defining white masculinity. We saw early articulations of white womanhood in need of protection made famous by the birth of a nation. There was a clearly defined villain and a clearly defined hero. And between those two characters was white womanhood, a victim in both narratives. This is one of the early, early mediated um, articulations of the damsel in distress, if you will, and we continue seeing it played out, especially with the significant number of women who overwhelmingly you know, voted for Trump. But for many of us, you know, we've continued to state that we matter and that we should control our own bodies and our own narratives and our own agency. Self-definition, that is the core of intersectionality. So in thinking back to lashes against women for exerting their own agency, you know, it becomes clear that masculinity in whatever form has never really protected womanhood. It's merely protecting its own fragility, its own interests. And it's been using the defense of women to showcase brute power, control, and dominance. And as we continue to center ourselves, the backlash is real. The repressive tar policies that are targeting women right now um, is one of the latest examples of that. But why? Why do we have to constantly insert our own existences into spaces? Why are we not recognized or acknowledged? Or are we constantly forced into others' definitions of us? I mean, I know the answer why, you know, but, but I'm certain, you know, that we're going to continue reminding you um, because we refuse to bear the lash in silence or, or isolation. The marginality that accompanies our outsider status often generates, you know, feelings of anxiety and frustration, but it also generates some of our most innovative creativity. And using black women's innovative use of digital technologies via the hashtag reappropriating imagery or what you would call memes, Facebook or gaming, whatever example, um, I'm going to you know, use some of those examples to really highlight the unique, uniqueness of black women's digital practices. 
Um, let me go back to this slide right here. Women of color are often touted as poster children, you know, for the digital divide. But we have historically utilized media and technology, um, you know, for our own means. Um, uh, and we've also really mobilized some of the most marginal among us. But this hacking, if you will, you know, is often viewed counter to what the originators intended. And it's often downplayed as not innovative um, or not creative. Um, or somehow, you know, black women, they're playing around with it. You know, they're not serious with these kinds of things or, you know, they we're constantly failing. Um, and some of the things that we do um, may be seen as failures, whereas our counterparts are often praised for the same things. Um, and so it's important to really explore this tax savvy, um, um, especially for our ability to, to breach the boundaries of what's normal of what's acceptable and what's been really defined for us. So what do we call it? Hashtag feminism, feminist futures, digital feminism, techno feminism, you know, I, I think it's, you know, those words are useful, um, but those conceptual frameworks, you know, they fail really to capture um, that the structural inequalities that really prevent access um, and really um, um, uh, highlight what women are able to do in the face of so much adversity, right? Um, and because they're missing like that, that acknowledgement of the role that identity also plays um, and how we refuse to part ways with any aspect of who we are. We want to make sure that they're central and that they're present. Um, so we don't want to forego any aspect of ourselves when we enter a space. Um, and I think that's one of the key things um, that some of our previous frameworks have failed to really consider. Um, and it's also important that the analytical frameworks that, that we have, that they have the ability to deconstruct structural inequalities. And we don't want to just talk about them. We want to figure out a way that we can liberate people and liberate folks from the, the confines of uh, the lasting legacies of, of that oppression. Um, so in my, in my journey to really create this, this framework, black digital feminism, um, I, I utilize the tenets of techno-feminism, of cyber-feminism, um, and I also incorporate that with a critical race feminist perspective and thinking about what it actually looks like. So the three um, points that I'm, I've been working on and working through and with um, are the social structural oppression of technology in virtual spaces, intersecting oppressions experienced in virtual communities, both virtual and physical communities, and also the distinctness of the feminist community. I think those are some of the, the three points that are the most important to talk about. So thinking about the first, you know, matters of institutional racism, damaging stereotypical images, sexism, classism, those are routinely addressed by critical race feminists. And incor incorporating the inherent masculine bias in technology and the default whiteness of virtual spaces is important as well. Um, Coco, Nakamura, and Rodman, they argue that the internet is far from liberatory, but rather is a space that continues a cultural map of assumed whiteness. Coco pointed out that attempts to make race, ethnicity, and other aspects of identity present are met with resistance from colorblind resistance, um, from wanting to force certain bodies into the cultural norms that exist within these spaces. And this assumed body excludes so many marginalized folks who are wanting to participate in these spaces, right? Um, oftentimes, in the re some of the research that I've done, you know, they're marked, their bodies are marked as deviant because you're a woman in the space, because you're a person of color in the space, because you don't speak English within the space. Um, so I don't use deviants to really talk about um, some of the inequalities or the oppression, the racism or sexism. I don't root that as deviant. I root those folks who are, who are violating this space, who are intruders into this locker room, if you will. I hate using that. I used to use it a lot. I don't like using it now. But I'll use it for this. You all know what I mean. Um, we are um, intruders into these spaces that have not been defined and created for us. So the creation of something like Black Lives Matter or Say Her Name, they're merely tools to reframe a narrative that has limited black and brown bodies to skewed framing and that, that have um, influenced public perceptions and made certain communities vulnerable, you know, really to state violence. The conflicting constructions of blackness in particular only serve to reify who is and who is not eligible for full inclusion into humanity. So when one utters Black Lives Matter, you know, it may lead to controversy, it leads to claims of reverse racism, and it leads to the creation of All Lives Matter. 
The second theme within this black digital feminist framework is that women must confront and work to dismantle the overarching and interlocking structure of domination in terms of race, class, gender, ability, and other forms of identity. Because individuals experience oppression in different ways, we must not create a one-size-fits-all approach in understanding what oppression is. So the construction of a hashtag that reads solidarity is for white women is largely rooted in the failure of white feminism to adequately address the realities of women of color. But it's read as black women being angry, black women being bullies, black women engaging in toxic forms of feminism. Mickey Kendall, she's the creator of hashtag solidarity is for white women, and she created it in response to a rant by self-proclaimed male feminist Hugo Schweitzer, where he stated he'd been particularly awful to women of color. And so she highlighted it, and the outlash was swift and it was severe. But the case is also significant because it, it reveals the relationships that white women have, um, that white, excuse me, white men have, have had and how it's affected and impacted women's communities. Or as Nancy Henley describes, it's the everyday social relationships that glue together the social superstructure. And it's hard to broach that. It's hard to really break that, um, that structure. As Jesse Daniels articulates, the dominance of white women as architects and defenders of a framework of exclusive feminism has yet to be interrogated by mainstream feminism. But women of color have historically challenged universal feminism, and they currently employ social media to continue this practice. Now, while the backlash to Mickey Kendall and others who supported that hashtag was, was severe, the outpouring of serious and satirical tweets associated with it was empowering you know, to a lot of the, the individuals, the women of color and the allies who used it and who wanted to highlight um, that trend in mainstream feminism. And black digital feminism also encourages a privileging of women's perspectives and ways of knowing because our identities generate a particular knowledge about the world from our standpoint. And valuing these perspectives is the only way to liberate women from the confines of hegemonic notions, deeming these identities unworthy. And therein lies the power of hashtag not your Asian sidekick or hashtag this is 2016. Asian women in particular resisting the, the label of token or refusing to be anyone's model. These digital practices are rooted in the radical Asian womanist tradition that they control their own identities, resist patriarchy, and highlight discrimination in the public sphere, on the street, in the classroom, in the lab. And although all women share a common struggle examining intersecting realities, um, the, the distinctness of their lived experiences must be addressed. Now, women may share sexual oppression, but it's not clear how this can unite all women whose work and life expectancy and family life are also structured by the hierarchies of racism, ethnicity, colonialism, or nationalism. And it's also why a lot of women of color still hesitate to adopt the identity of feminist, instead uh, preferring the word womanist or just being who they are. Power differences between women are so great that even the similar struggle against men are different. And women struggle with te technology is indirectly a struggle with masculinity, the patriarchy, and male privilege. And cyber feminists, their inability to incorporate that structural nature of inequality results in a limited vision of liberation. As Fessel recognized, women cannot stand together against oppression if we stand in different power relations to one another. Black digital feminism also addresses the distinct nature of how women utilize digital technologies. Hashtag not your sassy friend. Hashtag not your mascot. Hashtag yamikanse. Hashtag not your mommy. Hashtag you mad though. Women have used social media for activism and change as well as to advance critical feminism and womanism. The internet has propelled activism and empowerment in that many individuals can take action on singular issues. And the, the tenets of black di digital feminism can never detach from the personal or from the structural or from the communal. And it can never detach from the political. And that sets black digital feminism apart from techno and cyber feminism. The key is in how marginalized women communicate and how their internet usage is a continuation of their offline selves. And it's important to note that these technologies aren't creating anything. 
They're merely providing a different outlet. Internet technologies, mobile tech, social media, they, they are all important in that they represent for women of color and other marginalized groups lacking resources a path to participate. These groups have never been voiceless. Those in power just haven't been listening. And these digital um, affordances and this digital technology only amplify their voices. And maybe in fact, because of black digital feminism's simultaneous engagement with the digital and with the physical, that the master's tools might finally be able to dismantle the master's house. That's all that I have, y'all. Thank you all. I'm done. So I'd like to take the uh, moderator's privilege and ask a first question, which is to bring you back, Kishana, to where you started. Yeah. Uh, now it is 2017, and now we are on the brink of something different. Uh, we on the brink, all right. Should we <laughs> think differently about how to behave online <clears throat> as yeah. black women, as women, as uh, across and yeah. within all of our different identities? We need to, one of the biggest things that I think we need to do is really start thinking collectively, identify the commonalities, the things that can connect us all, right? Um, because just one movement, one force isn't gonna do it. You know, an isolated march in one city and an isolated march in another city, that's not gonna do enough, right? So I think we really need to figure out a way to bring communities together to really figure out um, what is that common struggle against structural oppression, right? Um, but but there's, a, there's a long road ahead of us, right? You know, and I, I think whenever I look at the breakdown of the numbers and seeing who voted, you know, for Trump, you know, I, get, I get heartbroken every time, you know? Whenever I see overwhelmingly, you know, black women sacrificed you know, to say, you know, okay, we'll forget the super predator shit and stuff. Sorry, I'm sorry, stuff that you said and forget that. You know, we realize what's at stake and we'll sacrifice those things. Um, and not seeing that sacrifice, it was disappointing from like a lot of other groups and not seeing, you know, men of color overwhelmingly support that as well, you know. So I think that's one of the, one of the biggest struggles um, because we're still self interested. We're still just thinking about ourselves and we have to really think about. Who are we collectively? You know, who, who do we see ourselves as? You know, where do we want to be? You know, so I think that's, that's the saddest part. I'm still figuring that out, though. You know? so if anybody has answers for that, of course, this, this group has a lot of answers. I'll tell you that. You can see the email threads. There's a lot of answers for a lot of stuff. But we had to figure out you know, how, we can, how we can turn that into action. You know? Let me just follow up and, mm -hmm. and, and push you a little further. Does it mean using hashtags differently, for example? I think. Um, this culture is just one, um, one of many things that we can do, right? So there's power in it. Um, so I think, I think a lot of the, the, the creators of Black Lives Matter, for, you know, um, there's nothing new in, in what they were doing. You know, that wasn't different from you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago and highlighting you know, that um, um, violence at the hands of the state, right? I think it just gave us a different platform. And I think, I think so tapping into that and realizing the power that the hashtag has, that a lot of these different you know, um, digital tools have, we have to tap into that. But we can't forget you know, the physical, on the ground kind of mobilization as well. Actually connecting with people, because you know, um, we, we can't just always assume that everybody's wired either and that everybody has access to those kind of things. And, how, and even you know, some people don't, doesn't even think that that matters. So we have to figure out a way to reach people and go to people where they are also. Yeah. There are a lot of folks here that do those kinds of things as well. Um, so there's a model that exists for that. You know, it's not brand new stuff that we have to create or we'll have to make up. You know? I'd like to invite questions, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Hi, thank you. Uh, this has been a very good talk. I have one question and maybe it's not uh, about the body of your work itself, but it's, I want to pick your brain about something that we here at uh, the Brookman Center care about, which is the network neutrality. And do you think that net, net neutrality played a role in enabling black digital feminism? And 
Do we need to look at it from the feminist perspective? Sure, sure. Um, so just so I'm clear on, on what you're asking, you're thinking about how net neutrality, so that, that the technology doesn't do anything, it's the people who use, use it, right? Is that, is that what you're saying? Maybe? Um, making the like every content and the, every packet that travels around the internet uh, weights the same, so it doesn't discriminate. Um, and I think um, net neutrality is at risk, uh, like in the following months. Sure. And I want to see if. Um, like what we are losing besides net neutrality itself can be uh, the expression of these movements and all that. So yeah, it's it's yeah, like that. Sure. Um, I'm not I'm not sure that I know because I'm not sure that I'm I'm clear on really what you're saying. Do you have an answer? I want you to like expand on what you're saying because it sounds like I bet you have an answer. I'm sure you probably have like a response to that because I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't. And oh, I don't no. Wanna, I don't wanna um, well, I, I think that. What you're saying either. I mean, mm, I think net neutrality was key to mm -hmm. enable, for instance, Black Lives Matter, uh, mm -hmm. because it was thanks to net neutrality that um, that governments couldn't oppress sure. uh, the the language, and I think that's that in itself it's in danger, and mm -hmm. maybe uh, if we don't keep net neutrality, or uh, we uh, might lose like the these movements, and I wanted to see if uh, this was like a da like a perceived danger inside these movements. I got you. Um, I think what's I think what's important is that we recognize that you know technology has the creators bias. Um, it's there. Um, and so I think whenever I hear, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, you know, the term net neutrality, but whenever I think, you know, when people say that, you know, tech is neutral, you know, it, it can't be racist, it's not masculine, it's not that, right? Um, so when I think about the creation of a lot of these spaces, the creation of a lot of these things, and seeing the absence of a lot of bodies, um, and seeing the absence of diversity, seeing the absence of, like, some of the inclusive spaces, right? Um, so I think that's important that we focus on that. Because I think, uh, you know, a lot of folks, you know, want to claim you know, that, you know, it's, it's all a matter of the user and what a user does with the space, right? Um, so, but I think it's, it's really important that we highlight the in inherentness, and I think that's a lot of the framework that I use, you know, from a lot of these scholars who say, you know, it's, it's created with the bias of, of the person who, who implemented it, whether or not, you know, they're intentional with it or that they mean to do it, right? Um, so I think it's, it's something very innovative to when people can, can still break through and still get access to those spaces and still make it and still use that techno technology, you know, for their own means, appropriating it for whatever that, that they need to. Um, so maybe that's, that, maybe that's kind of what you're getting at, that even though it is, you know, kind of like neutral, we're still able to do what we want and what we need with those kinds of things. So maybe that's, maybe that's what you're saying. I don't know. So my bad for, for misunderstanding you. Yeah. Mary. Mary. Thank you. Thank you for your inspiration this morning. I needed that. Um, so this might be a follow-up to Paolo's question. Oh, I'm Mary Gray. I'm a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center uh, and, and at Microsoft Research. And my question is thinking about the work you've done on Xbox and the pleasure that women can draw from spaces that we otherwise would just write off as... Mm -hmm. You know, as misogynistic and racist, and why would you be there? Uh, and so maybe to some of what you're saying, the places where we um, both take pleasure and action in commercial spaces, mm -hmm. do you have, how are you thinking about the importance of occupying those spaces and also generating other spaces that are not yeah. necessarily at risk when we think about what's at risk with um, with putting any sort of use limits on on certain commercial spaces and, and having net neutrality yeah. 
um, regulate who's able to actually access and, and put content online. So how, how do you think about creating our own spaces, yeah. occupying commercial spaces? Absolutely. I often get asked, you know, because I've been a lifelong gamer, right? And so I often get asked, you know, how can you continue to play, you know, where there aren't characters that look like me, when there aren't developers that look like me, when there aren't, you know, it's not a community, you know, that, that really looks like me, right? Um, and so I think that... Um, I, I started this, this trend and this practice of highlighting the folks who are there, because I think um, um, we've always been there, we just haven't been acknowledged, right? And I think it goes into the, those marketing practices of who they're catering to, of who, who their assumed audience is. Um, so for instance, you know, just the Pew Research Center just revealed that you know, half, half of gamers are actually women. And that shocked people. There was no shock to us when we knew that we've always been in those spaces, right? And even with console gamers, you know, the, over, um, the overwhelming population of console gamers are, are black and brown um, uh, uh, men. Um, and so I think that we really have to focus on um, who is actually in the spaces and going to find them and going to seek them out. And so that's where, you know, a lot of my dissertation work, you know, kind of resided in. I'm like, okay, well, I know I'm in this space, but I'm not, I know I'm not the only one. Um, so let me go and find the communities. Let me go and find those women. Let me go and find the women of color and say, hey, what's been your experience? And then when we realize, you know, it's these, these shared commonalities, these shared stories of isolation, of exclusion, of not being catered to, of not being seen as valid or valuable in these spaces and as gamers. But we stayed there, right? You know, there was something that was still drawing us there in, into those spaces. Um, so I think um, that, you know, I just had a, had a conversation earlier where, you know, we were, we were sharing, you know, a conversation of like, you know, it doesn't take that much work. It's just a few extra steps. And so when we think about you know diversifying like an applicant pool like to make you know more um, uh, diversity like in, in in developers you know of apps or or tech, um, you just have to you know a lot of folks I think we have this dangerous trend of just casting a wide net and hope that they get there. But now let's go be targeted. Let's go and go to those you know black girls code. You know let's go to those spaces. Let's go to the schools that they're at. Let's go to the Howard's engineering program and see are are they there. So I think we just have to do a few of those extra steps, you know, to make sure that we're um, locating them as, as opposed to just casting a wide net and hoping that they that they magically, you know, enter into those spaces. But I think focusing on really historically knowing that it's always been folks that look like me in those spaces has kept me there. And I, I always try to think, how can I, you know, make the spaces better? Um, and how can I, you know, also have like, um, I guess like this kind of top top approach where they're like, you know, being inclusive of us as well in marketing and characters. And I think so last year, I think I, I swear people, somebody's gonna call, you know, 2016, like the year of the black gamer, if you will. You know, we had Mafia 3, you know, there was, you know, a really interesting engagement of with Battlefield 1 with the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, and there was also um, Watch Dogs 2, you know, featured uh, a black hacker, you know, in the Bay Area. Um, so, and those, these were, uh, I guess some of the, there was, it was a push, you know, from, you know, these, from, um, from these marginalized gamers, if you will, to say, hey, we want, um, we want characters to look, look like us. Even the, uh, the success of Oscar So White, for instance. If anybody watched the, you know, the Golden Globes, you, know, you can see some of that, that resistance is paying off in meaningful ways. You know, so I think, it's, I think there's just a value of you know, not giving up, of, of pushing those spaces. Because I know, I know the trend is like, you know, the table's not meant for us. So we need to create our own tables, right? And that's important too. Um, but we also, we, we need to make sure that we put the burden on them to say, hey, you still need to recognize that we're not, we're not going in anywhere. You know, we're, we're, we're still here. Um, so yeah, maybe that, hopefully that answered your question. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Muriel. First, thank you for the best birthday celebration I have had in a long time. <laughs> this is super illuminating and really inspiring. And yeah. something that I really admire about your work is how you navigate between like really high level feminist theory, yeah. but how you have like this bunch of observation and, and, and ethnographic work that you've yeah. done. And I just wanted to know like if you could tell us a bit about the story behind that, how, how your observations and your work sort of online really shaped like your yeah. path in feminist theory. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so it begins with the behemoth of the dissertation. Um, I was moved whenever I learned about you know, eth ethnography. Um, I, I thought that was just the most beautiful thing 
that anybody could have ever created, of actually being immersed into a culture and a community, um, of act, letting them tell their own stories. Um, but and it was it was the point after that when it was time to document all that stuff and transcribe all that stuff that I realized why we still feel sometimes that ethnography is very exploitative and voyeuristic, right? So it was um, during the transcription phase where um, I was urged to probably wrongly I don't know where they learned it to correct the the the, the speech correct the black vernacular, clean up the Spanglish, reduce the use of Ebonics and slang, so it would, would be more u academic user friendly, right? I said, hell no, I'm not getting ready to do that. <laughs> their language and their ways of knowing, their ways of being and seeing the world must be left intact, right? So. I ensure to keep every, instead of changing that, I refuse to make it that. Them is still dim. You know, so I wanted to do that. And then people were saying that I was going to run the risk of exploiting and, you know, kind of, kind of appropriating. Like, they, they, were, they were saying all these things. I was like, but we must begin to try to make sure that we keep those things intact so we aren't seen as, as exploitative and just coming in and coming out. And another thing that was has been really important to me is making sure that the narrators in my research I don't call them research participants or subject they're they're narrators um, and also making sure that if they aren't on board if you will with the way that I have made sense of their experiences or their realities the way that I interpret the data you know if you will um, they're a part of the process, so I, I go back to them. I said, you know what, I, I, I did a chapter. If you have time, do you mind reading this to make sure that you know, your, the, the meanings behind what you said and what you did you know, are intact? Now, that, took a, that takes a lot of work, right? I ran the risk even of missing deadlines, you know? Um, and even with my research, like in Ferguson, I still haven't mass produced all the, the data that, that I collected because I hadn't left the space better than what it was, right? So I want to make sure, you know, I'm, I'm in constant contact. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, the things that the, the folks are, are doing there, that the reforms are happening. I, wanna, I, I feel bad publishing this stuff and padding my own CV and getting success for myself if their conditions are still the same. And so I think that's what's key with, with feminist research, you know, making sure that you are staying true to the, the liberatory and transformatory practices that we say that we're doing, right? But again, I run the risk of not being able to secure tenure, of not really having all the, the pubs that I need. But I think that, you know, that's something that I agreed that I was going to do, and I'll, I'll make sure to, to continue to, to do that practice, right? I also, and I know I'm sorry, I want to make sure we get to other questions, but let, let me, I want to um, make this last point. Um, I'm criticized often. My book was criticized in academia for not being, I guess, profound enough or brilliant enough, right? Because I use simple language. I wasn't talking above anybody, right? And I wanted to make sure that anybody who picked up that book could understand exactly what I was saying from beginning to end. I didn't want them to get lost in the academic jargon or you know, that, that lingo that we often um, surround ourselves around, right? I wanted to make sure that that community that allowed me into their space understood every word about them. Because that's who it was about, right? It was about them. But I run the risk of not having my work featured in you know, university presses if I'm not articulate enough, you know? But that's all right. That's OK. Because I've still had success. Shit, I'm at MIT. I'm at Harvard. I'm at Microsoft. I'm, I'm doing good. So the template is working, you know? So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. My bad. Other questions, I'm sorry. I think there was a hand. Yeah, there's some hands over here. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Chris. Um, I have two um, comments or questions. The first one is that there's been um, a big debate about um, 
the people who lead the movement or um, yeah. there's been that whole big debate that, uh, for example, if I am uh, not black, I really cannot have the full, um, I don't have the full black experience and therefore I am not um, sure. best suited to, to lead the movement sure. in the fight for you know, those rights. Um, then on the other hand, there's always the question of, uh, for example, in feminism, if we want to advance the rights of women, we have to remember that these women exist in a society and we have to, as far as possible, um, move with the whole of that society with us. And so um, I wonder how you uh, view these things and how you get um, a sort of balance, if there's any balance, sure, sure. And, and how um, this um, appears in your work. Sure. Um, I, I think it's, 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 real, it's important, you know, know what you're saying. Um, I think I've kind of stopped caring about hurting people's feelings, if you will. Um, because if they're dedicated and devoted to the work that needs to be done, they check their feelings at the door, you know? They check the fragility at the door, you know? Um, and I think that's, you know, I think you're, you're kind of alluding to kind of like that ally building and, you know, allies being in, in some of these spaces. Um, there is work for them, tons of work for them. Um, I don't think that uh, allies, anybody who signs up to be an ally wants to be a central part of, you know, a group that's not theirs, you know, their, their movement, right? Um, they don't mind doing some of the behind the scenes work. They don't mind going to their own spaces um, and, and um, uh, making sure that those spaces are aware of what the movements are, right? Um, so I don't think that it's something that we need to, um, because cause to me it, it kind of goes into like, like this, this tone policing where we have to be nice enough so everybody's feelings are okay, right? You know, how you know, they're urging us to go away from this, you know, what I learned a few weeks ago, away from this call out culture. And, Say, oh no, you're just being so mean. So I think there's too much work to be done to really have to address all of all of that. Um, and if it's a, like I said, if it's a real ally that's dedicated to the work, they'll understand and they'll already come into the space equipped with exactly what they know that they need to do. They will have already addressed their own spaces. They'll check their own friends on Facebook that's talking crazy and reckless. You know, they'll do those things already. Um, so I don't think that, you know, we really don't have the time to make sure that everybody feels okay, you know, in a space because it's some serious work that we, 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 need, we need to do. Um, and again, of course, that, that's probably not the most, you know, PC or diplomatic, you know, response, if you will, but, you know, we don't, we don't have time for that anymore. Like whenever I was looking at all the things that Trump is doing right now, and he's not even the fucking president yet, and everything, you know, it's heartbreaking. You know, so we have so much work that we have to do. First off, to protect, make sure that women are protected. Make sure that, you know, our children are protected, some of our most vulnerable populations. So we need to do whatever we need to do, you know, check our own privilege at the door and, and just get, do the work. So these groups don't have to, you know. Well, I don't know if that was an answer or not. My bad. Yeah. Sorry. Meryl. Okay. Uh, I know we don't have a lot more time left, and it's a big question, so you can just answer, like, one okay. slice of it as you want. Yes, um, has to do with I guess, the applications of black digital feminism to the legal field, both mm -hmm. the law mm -hmm. and legality, with the understanding that intersectionality, like as it was theorized, started in law journals yeah, and, and you know yeah. women of color being pushed out of the, the right. center of mm -hmm. of law, and at the same time not a part of never yeah. been a part of our Supreme Court in, yeah. in this country. And so both like whether it's technology policy or sure. uh, police, you know. Uh, reform of, yeah. of, of pris imprisonment, whatever the sort of ways that you see black fem digital feminism in like one or two like takeaway ways um, and its application to legality, illegality in the legal system. Absolutely. I think the first thing that needs to happen is recognizing the, the scholarship that's there that exists on it. So I'm thinking about you know, the plethora of information that's come out, especially from critical race theory. Um, highlighting, you know, especially like with the criminal justice reforms, highlighting the oppression, highlighting the disparities, highlighting um, those kinds of things. You know, it exists already. I think it's a matter of if it's going to be implemented, you know, by those and put into actual practice. 
because um, I, I think, you know, we've spent a lot of time, you know, researching and we know these things already. You know, we know this. Um, so I'm not sure how else other than to, to continue to push, continue to just write, you know, the people who are making the policy in whatever field, you know, continue to do those kinds of things. Um, but I don't have an actual answer of how that can translate into actual meaningful policy. Um, and especially especially right, right now, you know, when, when we have, you know, the, the, the template of what happens when repressive policies are implemented. We know what's happening. We know what's going to come. Um, and to, to, to push back against that. Meryl, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. If you have an answer, I'd love to hear it. I don't know. Wanting to yeah. populate systems of power with, with people who haven't been a part of the system, but the system mm -hmm. itself yeah. uh, is you know, inculcated in harm. And yeah. so that... Absolutely. that and yeah. then putting those bodies into that space, you know, because they're already vulnerable populations. And having to be subject, you know, to these, the masculine culture, having to be subject, you know, to the culture that isn't responsive to your identity. You know, if you're a woman of color, if you're a queer, you know. So I don't, I don't, I don't know how do you withstand that and still survive and stay intact. You know, it's, it's tough. And we know that in academia, academia is the same as well. You know, somebody just talked about, you know, we always get every year, you know, there's, there's the research that says, oh, women's evaluations are always terrible. We know this already. Now, when is academia going to change to say, okay, well, we aren't going to put as much weight on these evaluations? No, that, that's not changing. That's not happening. Um, so I put a, like a little addendum, if you will, you know, in my evaluations. Okay, just so you know, this is, these evaluations are filtered through my black female body. So, you know, but it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do we have time for other questions? Yeah, my bad. Yeah, there's some. There's, Hi. Um, when you were talking, I thought about a couple of women, right? Um, Leslie Jones and what happened to her, mm -hmm. and Michelle Obama. Yeah. And, you know, the way in which she is sort of yeah. picking up a leadership role. Um, yeah. And, you know, I sort of went back to <laughs> a long time ago, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about, you know, I am Spartacus, right? Mm -hmm. And the way we use hashtags now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I am Michelle. And yeah. does that do good things or does it do bad sure. things? I mean, sure. what, what, what will we get from something like that? Sure, sure. I think, um, I think it's a matter, I guess, of how you measure, you know, if it's doing, if, what, what, it's, what it's doing when it's out there, right? Um, I really focus on, really on those marginalized folks who see these different hashtags and see themselves and, you know, it's like that, that level of empowerment um, that, that they have of being proud of, you know, you know, for instance, you know, Michelle Obama, a black woman like in, in that in that position. Well, that may not translate into much on a in the aggregate. You know, I think there's some power with that, you know, especially in these in these localized communities, you know, so I think there there's real value in that. And and especially like um um I'm I'm not aware of the I'm Spartacus hashtag. I don't I don't know this one. I don't know what that is. What was that? Okay. Okay. Oh, um, a million years ago, right? Kirk Douglas was Spartacus in a movie, right? And it was about a slave uprising. Mm. And, you know, they were trying to pick him out and punish him, right? And so, you know, Spartacus stand up and everybody became, I am Spartacus. You know, very like the hashtags, right? Where you join into a movement um, and make your declaration. And so, you know, and one of the things I'm wondering about is, you know, I know this is, I, I mean, black women's voices now are incredibly powerful in lots of places. And my question really is, I think in part, how can we, you know, white women who may not have done the right thing when we were voting as a, as a you know, community, sure. you know, total community, sure. because we didn't perceive ourselves as community, sure. how, can, how can we be supportive of this? Yeah. And, you know, not be bystanders, not be yeah. passive, you know, not accept those roles like in Birth of a Nation, but uh, yeah. really, yeah. Yeah. you know, be, be as powerful in our voices as, as right. many of the black women who are out there now. That's right. You got to go get your people. You got to go on and get, get your the white women that went and voted. And I really think it's important, you know, as we were talking in this, how we start with, within our own communities, right? 
Because I think a question that I would have is, if you were to like come into a space, you know, where, where you know black and brown women are organizing or doing something, I would be like, well, what was your response to the white women in your family that voted for Trump? You know, what have you done to like transform the spaces that you come from? What have you done to like change like your family? What have you done to transform like the classroom that you teach in? So I want to ask those kinds of things. You know, before you know, you, be, you come into a space you know, where we're trying to tr transform like on, on a larger level because those small, those intimate kind of spaces, are, that's where a lot of that, some of that, that really changed, that the effective change, you know, kind of really happens, you know? Um, and so I think a lot of times, you know, we just kind of ignore, oh, well, that's that's just how uncle is. Y'all know he races. Y'all know granny don't like gay folks. You know, I have to make sure that I'm, you know, critically addressing, you know, my own family, that own, my own circle because I can't really do anything out, out in the world if I can't even transform my most intimate spaces, you know? Um, so even if we can't change them, just making sure that the conversations are had as opposed to just ignoring them. Well, I can't do anything with them, but I'm going to go do something over here. I think we have to, you know, and, and that's even like kind of like your practice ground, if you will. You know, kind of like that ground zero kind of thing. Like, I'm gonna make, I know I'm going to make Granny mad at Thanksgiving, but I'm going to have to say it because I know she's going to say something that's so homophobic, you know, but I have to make sure to say, you know what I'm saying? So I think that, that it's important that we think about what have we done in our, our own private spaces first before we begin to kind of make that that big change that that would be my, my initial response before we even get to work you know to reform other other things like that you know. So Kashana, one of the things I really appreciate about your work is how you always hearken back to a rich pedigree of black feminist theory, um, bringing in people like Ida B. Wells. But um, a conversation I was having with a few of my colleagues was about this underlying disparity that's kind of forming about the current political moment and the contemporary and how distinct it is and that um, we're dealing with a set of problems that are particularly transnational. Yeah. It's, it's very different from the politics of Ida B. Wells. And so um, there's a necessity to create new visions for what we want for our future and not in the sense where people try to pressure Black Lives Matter to have a kind of a means and um, agenda, but more in the sense of what is the future that we're fighting for. Mm, and so my mm. question is, what mm -hmm. does the virtual and the digital do to contribute to that future vision, vision and how can we incorporate those spaces? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think it's important that we acknowledge um, what's the same, you know? Um, so in, you know, in the era that Ida B. Wells, you know, was speaking whenever she was talking about, you know, like lynching practices and things like that, um, a lot of black feminists would say that not much has changed, you know, so they would liken, you know, the death of Mike Brown, you know, the death of, you know, Alton Sterling, the, all these deaths still within that same frame of lynching, right? Um, so, you know, kind of like this, there's nothing new under the sun kind of thing, where it's just kind of like a, a different... You know, what's, what's that one saying? Somebody said something about, you know, same shit, different day. Something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so I think it's important that we recognize the things that we've always addressed. Because those are same, you know, the, the structural inequalities, the institutional inequalities. Um, some of the language is still the same. It's kind of like just like different iterations of, of what's happening, right? Um, and I think that digital tools are just giving us, like, the means to kind of address it differently. Um, because again, you know, something like Black Lives Matter is no different than you know what was happening, you know, uh, you know, behind like Rodney King, for instance. You know, the conversations with body cams was the same conversation we had with dash cams. You know, so it's like you know the technology you know might be changing some of the conversations, but the basic premise you know is, is still there. Um, and so, as opposed to you know what future are we fighting for? Yeah, I guess I haven't really like like articulate that. What kind of future do do, do we do we want to have? You know, one like a, a utopia, you know, one where um, you know people have you know agency and control like over their own bodies. One where you know we've dismantled all these different structures of oppression. You know, yes, yes to all that. You know, and I don't know how you know we go from this moment of you know black digital feminism. You know, to like to get there. I just know that the conversations need to continue to to be had. And then that there's like really serious engagement that we're dismantling, you know, like a lot of these barriers that that exist. And we start within our own ivory tower, if you will. You know, how can we as academics, you know, do better, transform spaces, 
you know, the lack of diversity in some of our, we can do small things like going to Dorchester and finding the young people that are there, you know, going and making sure that they have access to these different campuses, you know, of Harvard and MIT, small things that, 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 that we can do. You know, I think I don't want the conversation to get too big. You know, you presented, you know, a big question. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. But I think we got to make sure that we keep the, the conversation small and digestible enough that we can consume it and that we feel like we can still, you know, affect change around that. You know, so I never want the conversation to get too big because it could be overwhelming. Or we could say, well, we can't change nothing anyway. You know, we can. We can start within our, our own spaces and then just go from, go from there. Yeah. Say, for instance, <clears throat> I'm a man that attends a talk on black digital feminism, and I'm quiet and don't ask any questions, but I would like to learn more about the topic. Yes. Uh, where do I go? Where are some resources I can go to just dig in on my own? Yeah, absolutely. Well, how about by the end of the afternoon, you can go to my website, and there will be a plethora of information <laughs> that you can get. So www.kishanagray.com. It's not there yet, but I'll make sure that I upload different kinds of resources, because there are a lot of folks that are doing a lot of really like amazing things, even in our own you know, community, you know, um, even with, with, within our own you know, Berkman Berk Klein community. We're really doing some really innovative things. Yeah, and I love the hashtag, you know, Becca, that you started, where people are talking about the different things that they've been engaged in. It's, it's beautiful. It's really amazing. Um, you know, and I'm so humbled every time that I see, you know, the amazingness of the space. But let's make sure that we tap into, you know, these, these folks and that they're, because we have a great, and hopefully, I'm not sure how many people are affiliated with Berkman Klein, but there's really a community of folks that are really wanting to do work. For free, I'm just thinking about, you know, just last week when we were talking about, you know, like really like transforming spaces, you got people that really want to work. And so we have to make sure that we I connect into that, and I tap into that, and make sure that, that, we're, that we're doing all that. So, yeah, it'll be there. I'm always like, by the end of the day, I'll get it uploaded. Do we have one more question before I ask mine? Anybody else? So to tie together a number of the, of the themes of your tremendous talk and the, and the Q&A that has followed it, you write about the importance of claiming identity mm -hmm. online. In other words, early on, of course, people yeah. celebrated the fact that online you could pretend to be anybody. You didn't have to be revealed yeah. could be a as dog. a dog or a woman or a black woman. Yeah. Uh, now you can in in some more circumstances and spaces online, be identified. Sure. Uh, and you can, in fact, be identified in a defiant and somewhat provocative way, like with hashtags, sure. that may offend people in other groups yeah. that are potential allies or natural allies. Sure. Um, how do you balance, especially now, the importance, the, the important task of, of, of claiming identity and establishing solidarity with your smaller group, yeah. and on the other hand, um, um, bonding together with yeah. allies that are not in that smaller group, but that are in a, a larger one. And should that, this is a little bit like the question I started with, sure. do you need to shift that balance in any way at the moment? Or are there particular circumstances in which you would advise emphasizing one over the other? Sure. Um, I don't think I, I, I have not yet figured out how to create that balance where the different spaces I'm a part of are communicating and talking with one another, right? Um, so I'm still... So a lot of the spaces that I'm a part of are still independent of one another, right? Even with, you know, some of the, some of the things that, you know, I've done, you know, with, with Black Lives Matter, some of the things that I've done, especially with the women who oppose uh, Gamergate, um, these are still distinct communities, right? And I think it was at that moment of August 2014, you know, with the, um, with the death of Mike Brown, with the rise of Gamergate, that I realized the impossible nature of really existing in these two different worlds. They collapsed for me. They weren't that different. They weren't that distinct. So I think in, the, I think in that moment, that was the time that I, I realized that I had to have a conversation um, with both of those groups to show the, that commonality of the oppression, right? 
Um, and that was kind of what I did with, I think, you know, I had a, I hope I'll plug some work here. And the diversifying Barbie and Mortal Kombat book, you know, I talk about, you know, that tension between, you know, um, women within that gaming community of how they said, you know, the moment right now is to fight against Gamergate. And you had an, another group of women that said, you know, no, that's not really important right now. You know, you're not dying in the street. You know, it's Black Lives Matter, you know. So I think it's really having those kinds of conversations to show, well, you know, these, these aren't opposing fights, you know? They're not so distinctly different that we can't tackle them both at the same time. I wasn't successful in that group of, you know, figuring that out. I wasn't um, successful, but, you know, I still worked, you know, with both. Um, but I think it just got me thinking about more how do we bridge that? How do we create that balance so we can see? And I think that's one of the questions, you know, that, 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 that big question that I haven't yet figured out um, is how to, to bring them all together, you know, so they can just, um, kind of coexist, and that's how we have to do that building to really resist some of the stuff. I'm figuring that out, so as soon as I figure it out, I'll let y'all know. Okay. Yeah. So stay tuned and keep track of that website and the multiple uh, magnificent uh, ways in which Kishana yeah. does tell us what she has figured out. Um, she's something of a fountain of answers, even though she might try to deny it. So thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much.